Hi everybody, Dr. Friedman here. We're at the start of week four of this class on games and storytelling. I have talked about in previous videos about the kind of weird timing of this particular week, which I'm referring to as obligatory Dungeons and Dragons week. It's a little tricky when dealing with a group of some experienced players and some total newbies to the hobby to figure out when to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And as I've talked about at length elsewhere, the scholarship almost demands that this week be earlier the next time around. That said, uh, we're going to dive in. So far, students have read a lot about the history of role-playing games and terminology around role-playing games, narratology, and more. But this is the first time that we're actually explicitly talking about Dungeons and Dragons and its impact on our culture for the last half century. Uh, so today we read Alex Chalk's A Chronology of Dungeons and Dragons and Popular Media, which appears in Analog Game Studies, an open access uh, journal that you can go read yourself and tell me what you think. Students had a lot of questions about um, the kind of different stages or um, milestones in the history of D&D and whether all people who experience these stages, you know, kind of think in the same way that Alex Chalk does, um, which Alex kind of charts a path from the satanic panic of the early uh, editions and years of D&D through its kind of instantiation as a kind of byword for geek culture in popular media to the kind of moment we're in now where actual plays are quickly becoming their own industry, their own art form, with their own sets of genre expectations. What a time to be alive and playing D&D. But of course, many of our collective have not yet played D&D. And so what we did today, in part because it was on the syllabus, but also in part because, you know, the world's always already on fire, especially this semester, um, but we're, we're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. We've been doing a lot of heavy reading. We've been doing a lot of kind of intensive work. Um, so we slowed down today a little bit uh, to kind of catch our breath and walked through um, the act of playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so in addition to Alex Chalk's timeline, we took a look at Matthew Mercer's one shot that he ran for Red Nose Day with Stephen Colbert. For those of you who are thinking about teaching Dungeons and Dragons and introducing uh, folks to the hobby and explaining how it works, judging from the responses on Perusal, this was an ideal choice. You can get more specific in terms of mechanics, you can get a lot of bang for your buck with a lot of other choices, but in less than an hour, you can get a sense of the main rules and mechanics and have an enjoyable and impressive storytelling experience by watching, having students watch, you know, one of the masters of the form at work with a, with a player who is familiar in theory, uh, but is their experience is not a fifth edition D&D. So it's kind of a reintroduction in those sorts of ways. It was a really great start and I can't tell you how uh, delightful it is to kind of see something that you take pleasure in or that I take pleasure in um, kind of enjoyed by my students. So um, that's, that's, that's always fun. And as a scholar of 18th century fiction, it's not always something that I'm used to. Um, which led to a lot of questions around kind of what changes from edition to edition. Why are there, why, how are we on fifth edition? What's the difference between the editions? And there are um, some really useful explainers on the internet that I'm going to link to and that my students will get links to. Um, but I think one of the important kind of uh, ways of thinking about it that I introduced in class is this uh, kind of movement from the kind of deadly gotcha, wargaming intensive uh, state of play in the Gygaxian sense 
to the kind of more improvisational based, um, rule of cool based. Um, we're going to watch a lot of Abria Iyengar next week um, at work in the DM seat, which I think is a really uh, useful and liberatory way of thinking about um, what DMing and what the relationship between DM and player look like, even when it can kind of somewhat look adversarial. Um, but is truly collaborative in, in different kinds of ways. Uh, the way that I had students think about it, because I have a third of the class are future teachers, and of course everyone in the class is in a class that they're not entirely comfortable or familiar with at least in terms of the contract grading, which is something I talk about in another video. And so I said to them, imagine a classroom where, um, you know, what might happen uh, is potentially dangerous um, or have a lot of intense consequences and you might be prepared for it or you might not. You won't know whether something is coming for you. Um, you and the world feels hostile and arbitrary. What kind of player or what kind of student might you be in such a scenario? And of course, the answer is, one. Of, some of the many good answers are, you'd be very careful, you'd be very, very cautious, um, and you'd start to get into a relationship with the person running the game or the class where you're trying to anticipate what they want. It's no longer about fun of a game or learning in a classroom in that kind of adversarial context. It's about avoiding pain and con consequences. Um, when you don't feel like you know how to succeed beyond following the rules. And in some ways, that's how I kind of envision the kind of early Gygaxian interface, um, the, what's hard baked into some of the, the early logic of Dungeons and Dragons. The world is cruel uh, and it, uh, it rewards those who are paranoid um, and even then, you might stick your hand somewhere where it shouldn't go, and that's why we have 10-foot poles. This is a, a little bit of an overstatement. Um, not all tables ever operated like this, but that is part of some of the, the, the rhetoric and language around early D&D that still continues because, of course, the people who played the earliest editions of D&D didn't, like, all die in an extinction event. Um, and in fact, there are some enjoyable parts of playing those kinds of crunchy, gritty sorts of mechanics. There are people who take pleasure in that. Um, but imagine if players who are acculturated to those kinds of tables, students acculturated to that logic of learning, coming into spaces like the Abria Iyengar rule of cool, or my class that says, you can do what you want. We're going to make a deal together about what learning is going to look like, what mastery is going to look like. Um, you know, we're going to start off with some training wheels and then you're going to go do whatever the hell you want. And I'm here to coach and I'm here to help you set constraints and I'm here to help you figure out the pathway forward, but I don't necessarily have a vision for what mastery looks like in specifically in relationship to you. I said, how does that feel? And it became a really useful conversation, not only about like the difference between fifth edition and earlier versions of Dungeons and Dragons, but also a kind of meta conversation in parallel about this class, which is scary um, when you've spent your entire like, you know, growing up according to the kind of logics of, you know, standardized testing and I follow the rules and the rules are arbitrary, but if I follow them, I will be rewarded and maybe I can game them. But, you know, uh, and so it can seem like all of the sudden, would you trust a dungeon master? Would you trust a professor who tells you there are no rules or that there are minimal rules or that the rules are flexible and subject to negotiation? If all you've ever heard are there are rules, you may not know them, but they will be, they will come for you in some way, shape or form. Um, the chair is a mimic. Um, 
I really liked where this conversation ended up going. I think it was really, really fruitful in ways that I had not imagined. I didn't come in assuming that we were going to have a, class, a discussion at the meta level about this class when we talk about Dungeons and Dragons. But in retrospect, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense that we would be having a conversation about um, kind of the, the dangers or the impact of increased flexibility um, in, in the context of both my class in relationship to other classes they've taken, but also in relationship to this game. Um, so yeah, so that was the big bulk of, I think, our big like brain bursting ideas for today, um, which I think is, you know, enough. Uh, really useful, especially since we have just kind of finished wrapping up thinking about, um, you know, the initial drafts of our contracts for what students are going to pursue moving forward. Um, from playing a lot of one shots to watching some actual plays to some hybrid of, of the two. We spent the last part of class looking at character sheets. I had used the kind of character sheets of different editions as a way in to uh, thinking about the, the change in, you know, different kinds of granularity across the different um, editions of D&D. So we jumped onto D&D Beyond. I mean, we're good Alabama folks. Uh, D&D Beyond was started in Huntsville, Alabama. So it seemed only appropriate that we use this tool. It's also really handy because it's kind of a step-by-step walkthrough explainer. Um, so I create, I showed them the character that they helped me create um, as part of the initial student survey uh, that I played in a one shot uh, with uh, Adam Bradford and Christina Ariel and um, a whole bunch of other um, amazing folks um, early this summer, um, which I may have a link to. We'll see. You can look in the notes and see if I have it, if I found it after I did this blather. And then we also... Um, Kind of built a new character. My, as I was showing my students today, um, my home campaign, the one that I play with professors from Auburn here, um, is coming to a close. You can see, as I showed students today, uh, this is the final rounds of combat against a Sararak, um, including bone drones. Don't ask about the bone drones. We have a bard. He's a theater professor. This is, this is what happens when you have a theater professor who's a fucking bard. Um, but we use this as a way of thinking about, you know, I'm obviously a little bit more of a secretary than, than, many, than many folks, um, but these are the rounds of combat and what people did and, and keeping track of how many bone, animated bones were left, um, for example, um, before we got to the end. Um, but kind of showing kind of how play works um, was part of what we were thinking about. But also, you know, beating a Sararak means that my home game is really close to being done, which means I have to make a new character. And if you have thoughts about what kind of character belongs in Waterdeep, then I'd be happy to hear about it in the comments. Um, or you can tweet at me. Uh, but so I walked them through the creation of a very simple kind of sorcerer gnome um i'm kind of really fascinated by sorcerers um that's by the by um but so we talked about the way that rules as written a concept that we introduced today or raw um kind of values uh, or puts puts uh, a character together initially by race and class um and there's lots of videos on on how those things work um, and, you know, you can try to optimize these things, you can make choices based on flavor, um, you know, you can, and, and that's something that you decide, but you can also decide, as I will, in community with the other players that I have, because Waterdeep is a, a more social urban game, and so we're going to have existing relationships, and figuring out what those relationships are means that character development isn't just me sitting down at D&D Beyond, but me sitting at the table with my DM, and my DM's kind of boundaries, and my and my fellow uh, players, and what, we, what kind of story we want to tell together. Um, so, you know, that was... Uh, something we walked through and then we did some explainer of some of the, you know, how mechanically these things work. We looked at the character sheet in kind of detail. We played around literally um, with this form, um, which is really great. It also allowed us to kind of, 
kind of start to plant the seeds of other ways of thinking about the game that that game developers and designers and people who play the game you know we've we've got the notion of homebrew now in our head um the idea that players too can create new sets of rule sets um so next time we're going to be talking about um, those kinds of transformative ways of thinking um the notion of decoupling racial uh you know race which is really species from traits um as a movement um but also thinking about the history of um both gender representation in terms of who is given credit for their labor on the game and the game design as well as the way that women have been re represented in different editions of the game or not um in addition to thinking about um you know other kind of things like around race and sexuality and um, and gender identity that are in the process of transformation, I hope, um, because the game is something that is created in community, although it is also a corporate entity. Um, so we'll be talking about those tensions um, on Thursday when we talk about debates in D&D, and then we'll continue almost assuredly to have those kinds of discussions when we talk about actual play next week. And it sounds like we're going to be returning to kind of thinking about um, D&D as cultural phenomenon when the students start to direct our, our thinking and learning together in weeks 6 through 12. Um, so for Thursday, we're going to be reading uh, Trammell's Misogyny in the Female Body in Dungeons and Dragons, another piece from Analog Game Studies. Um, Cecilia de Anastasio's Dungeons and Dragons Wouldn't Be What It Is Today Without These Women, which is a piece from Kotaku. Um, a D&D &D Beyond piece of content around portraying Asian themes and ideas in D&D &D with Daniel Kwan and a panel of folks. And the first Black AF uh, roundtable on Twitch, um, which I've seen students are already starting to watch and asking for more content of that of that form. And as someone who's kind of uh, ways of thinking about the game and ways of thinking about the industry and ways of thinking about labor and ethics are so very much indebted to folks like Tanya to pass. I'm just thrilled to teeny tiny bits that uh, that's something that, that my entirely uh, white uh, classroom is really latching onto. So we're going to have a little bit more of intensive, potentially heavy uh, stuff to think about, not in terms of like reading load. We've, we've kind of crossed the, the Rubicon in terms of big, long theory readings, unless students ask for more of that. Um, but now we're kind of dealing with readings that are and, and viewing experiences that are not necessarily long um, or necessarily dense but have a kind of a, a lot of a lot of things for us to think about not just in terms of role-playing culture but culture more generally um, and the state of play so to speak that we're in now um, so that's uh that's where we are with today's kind of campaign diary um, there are more subscribers now because people started following me on twitter uh which is really cool and kind of scary um, I'm still a professor and so any kind of numbers are kind of kabonkers uh, to, in, in that sense. Um, but I'm hoping that this becomes uh, a kind of useful way of t showing folks, even after this class is over, um, some other ways of including role-playing games and the concept and the ideas behind role-playing games into other courses. So. Um, just as a note for for folks who, who are watching who are not my students trying to catch up on what they might have missed because they were unable to attend class, um, I'm teaching a British literature survey, 1789 to the present, uh, next semester. Some game play will be included in there. And then I'm almost assuredly going to be teaching an 18th century class um, next semester, which means that this channel will kind of come back a little bit to its roots in terms of thinking about playing the 18th century, both games inspired by the 18th century and games that might help us illuminate uh, some concepts about the 18th century. Um, so that's the, that's all in the future. Um, thanks for watching, um, whoever you are. If you're my students, of course, you always have me over email on Canvas and on Discord. Um, if you are not my student, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, please feel free to leave comments or you can tweet at me at Freed, F-R-I-E-D-E. -E. And 
See you on Thursday for debates in D&D.